Okay, may I, may I have your attention, everybody? So, good evening to everybody and welcome. Um, thank you very much for coming along to our, our public talk this evening. I'm Richard Watt, I'm the Head of Department in Economics and Finance here at the University of Canterbury and um, my task will be to introduce the speaker tonight. The, there is a formality that I need to undertake nevertheless before doing that and that is to read out your health and safety messages. Um, maybe this is new to you because but we have had earthquakes here of late and uh, there has to, this has to be said. Um, well, first, nothing to do with earthquakes, but uh, if anyone needs um, the public toilets or anything, straight across the foyer, you'll find those. If the fire alarm sounds or any other emergency um, is, is uh, put into place, we must remain as a group and, re and move to our e evacuation point, which is that way out the building in, in the car park area out there. Um, the girls out the, f out the door here are our UC hosts and they'll be wardens in case of an emergency so we'll just follow their instructions. If there were to be an earthquake, the instruction is drop cover and hold. It doesn't say pray, but that might help too. When the shaking stops, then we evacuate. Um, likewise, if there's a fire, we'll activate the nearest fire alarm and dial 611 to notify security. And I don't, is the fire wardens thing over there. Are you the fire warden tonight? Um, Probably. <laughs> okay, so that will do for that. Um, let me introduce our speaker. Um, Philippe Legrain is a, a, an economist specialising in global and European economic affairs, including topics such as globalisation, migration and post-crisis world affairs. He comes to us with a wealth of international experience um, in, in economics as a consultant, advisor and, and correspondent, for example, uh, at various stages throughout his career. He's worked as the trade and economics cons cons correspondent for The Economist uh, magazine, as a special advisor to WTO director Mike Moore. And he was a, an advisor to the European Commission President José Manuel Barroso. And he is a visiting senior fellow at uh, London School of Economics uh, European Institute. As an author, uh, he is a writer for Financial Times, The Guardian, The Times, The Wall Street Journal, and a commentator on BBC's outlets. And he has authored four books on topics around globalization, immigration, and post-crisis economics. His 2007 book, on the, a topic relevant to today's talk, immigration, was shortlisted for the Financial Times and Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year Award. Uh, Philippe holds a, a Bachelor of Science in Economics and a, ma a Master of Science in Politics of the World Economy, both from LSE. So thank you very much for coming along tonight, Philippe, to talk to us. We're very interested and in, uh, expectant of your talk. And uh, after we after you finish, we'll run a question and answer session, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction, and it's great to be here with you uh, this evening. I, it's great that you're all here on a Friday evening um, when you could be at the pub, so I appreciate that uh, you, you've all made the effort to be here. I've been uh, touring around um, uh, New Zealand uh, over the past uh, week, uh, spreading the message about why it's a good thing to employ refugees. Uh, and I've saved the best uh, for last uh, here uh, in Christchurch. I was here nine years ago um, when I was invited over here by the New Zealand government. And I have very fond memories um, uh, of uh, your town. And I hope that you are uh, recovering successfully uh, from the terrible earthquake that you suffered. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about the opportunities from employing uh, refugees, um, why it's also good for uh, society as a whole, and how to overcome uh, any challenges that might arise. And i just start by introducing you to Mohammed. Now Mohammed used to run an upholstery business in Damascus. 
You can't hear me. Can you hear me now? No? Is that not? Okay, can you hear me now? Better? Because I was told that doesn't, it's not for me. Okay, but fine. Anyway, okay, well, now it, you have to hear me. It's good, good that you can hear me. There's nothing more frustrating than sitting uh, in a room where someone is um, speaking and you can't hear a thing they're saying. So that, that, that meet Mohammed. Mohammed used to run a um, upholstery business in Damascus. And then the terrible barbaric civil war, which is still ongoing, uh, broke out. Uh, and he and his family uh, were forced uh, to flee. And it was a um, you know, long, difficult, a dangerous journey, like you've seen on the TV. And eventually he ended up in the German city of Kiel. And there, as it turns out, uh, his skills as a textile engineer were in high demand. So. Meet Christian. Christian uh, is the owner of Coastworks, which is a company that makes sails for boats. There are probably many companies like that here uh, in uh, New Zealand. And for years, he hadn't been able to find suitably skilled workers. So when he met Mohammed, he jumped at the opportunity and he offered him a part-time job. That became a full-time job. Uh, and now uh, Mohammed uh, is running uh, a new line of business for Coastworks, which is Sun Awnings. And you can see they make a great team. <laughs> and it's not just uh, Mohammed and Christian, uh, it's actually a family affair because w one of his sons, Ahmed, works part time while studying at university, and his other son, Yusuf, uh, is doing an apprenticeship uh, in sail making. And thanks to, to Mohammed and his family, and thanks to other refugees who are now working at Coastworks from Syria and from uh, Afghanistan, Christian has finally been able to expand capacity to meet increased demand and indeed to expand uh, into new lines of work. And I think what that story captures beautifully uh, is something that um, businesses often overlook which is that investing in refugee talent isn't just about doing good, it also makes good business sense. Now, there's something about the global refugee crisis that can seem absolutely overwhelmingly huge. We're talking about more than 68 million people forced out of their homes, more than 25 million of those forced out of their country, a further 3 million in the process of seeking uh, asylum. And while you get the impression in the media that all of them are heading uh, to rich countries, whether it's Australia uh, or Europe, the reality is very different. 85% of them are in uh, developing countries, often uh, the poor neighbours of uh, the country from which they're coming. So you see that tiny Lebanon has more Syrian refugees than all of Europe put together. Lebanon has a population of 4 million. Very, very few make it uh, to place, rich places like uh, New Zealand, and those that, and those that do uh, have been uh, carefully vetted uh, by international and national programs. As you, as you may know, the annual quota here in New Zealand uh, is 750 people rising to 1,000, set to rise to 1,500 uh, by uh, 2020 if the government keeps its promises. So we're still talking, though, about a small, uh, select uh, group of people who've gone through absolutely uh, unimaginable uh, hardship. And the decision of a Kiwi employer uh, to hire them can transform their lives. And I would argue also that the refugee can transform that organisation and indeed uh, improve society as a whole. Because there's often this perception that refugees are a burden. 
one that well-meaning people think we have a human humanitarian duty to bear, one that less charitable people think that we have a duty uh, to minimize. And it's true, yes, there is an initial cost uh, from welcoming people who are fleeing persecution and death. But my research shows that welcoming refugees is actually a humanitarian investment that can yield sizable economic dividends. So my research uh, for OPEN, which is a think tank that I founded, and the Tent Foundation, which is an American foundation, shows the following, that if you invest one euro or one dollar in welcoming refugees, it can yield two dollars in economic benefits within just five years. That's an impressive return on investment. Now, how, does, how do I reach those calculations? Well, first of all, because the initial spending uh, on welcoming refugees, whether it's on food, whether it's on shelter, whether it's on teachers, whether it's on translators, tends to be spent on local goods and services, and that creates jobs in the local economy. And then, once refugees uh, start working, uh, they contribute further through the work that they do, through the taxes that they pay, through the businesses uh, that they start. And I used IMF data so that I couldn't be accused of suddenly you know, fiddling the figures to make it look good. This is robust international data uh, which shows this. What that tells you then is that getting refugees into work ought to be a top priority. It's not just good for the economy, it's good for society as a whole. It helps neutralize this mistaken belief that they are somehow uh, a burden, and indeed the notion in some quarters that they're a threat, because once someone who arrived as a refugee is your friend or your colleague, uh, you will no longer see them as a threat. On top of that, of course, working benefits refugees themselves. You know, while they may have suffered immensely, they don't want to be seen as victims or charity cases. They want to start rebuilding their lives. They want to contribute to their new home. They want, and work is the stepping stone to do that. It doesn't just, think about what work means to you. It's not just about having an independent income and being self-reliant. It's feeling valued. It's feeling that you're contributing something. It's having some, a status in society. And even an entry-level job can be a stepping stone to bigger things. And I know that from my personal family experience, because um, my mother was born in a refugee camp. Uh, my grandparents um, moved to the United States as refugees. And my grandfather, who you see pictured here, he had a PhD in aeronautical engineering. But his first job when he arrived in the United States uh, was in a factory making wooden floors. And he told me he was delighted to have it. He was delighted to have it because he was, he was self-reliant again. He was starting to rebuild his life and he was contributing to his new home, to which he was so grateful. So getting refugees ought to be a top priority for moral reasons and for economic reasons. And while you might think that that's an impossible thing to achieve, actually you see that in around the world, in countries not dissimilar to New Zealand, that they achieve amazing results. 70% of refugees who arrive with, in the United States or Canada find a job within one year of arriving. There's no reason that with the right help here in New Zealand that we shouldn't be able to achieve similar results. Now, one reason why you might want to employ a refugee is that you want to help someone in need. And that's great. Doing good by trying to help people in need is a noble thing to do. And also, if you're a business, it can help you earn goodwill from the government, uh, from local authorities, uh, from your customers. It can help motivate and retain your employees. So when there was the huge 
arrival of refugees uh, in Germany, many local businesses felt they needed to do something to help. They just felt they needed, they needed to chip in. What they didn't expect, that one of the biggest benefits they felt was suddenly their employees were much more motivated to come to work. They felt suddenly a huge purpose for what they were doing, that they were working for a, com for a company that was trying to make a difference. That clearly, again, is a huge benefit. At the same time, there's also a strong business case for employing refugees. Now, researchers have worked with businesses to calculate the return on investment uh, from uh, recruiting refugees, and typically, it's highly positive. Again, think back, these are people who are desperate to rebuild their lives, and that means they're typically very hardworking, very highly motivated, and loyal employees. <coughs> Many of them have valuable skills. It's little known that 30% of refugee arrivals here in New Zealand have professional qualifications. They're people like Mohammed with valuable skills to contribute. Others are willing to do difficult jobs that young Kiwis no longer want to do, like work on farms, for, ex for example. And more broadly, having a more diverse workforce, whether it is re with refugees or other diverse workforce, tends to boost creativity and innovation. And also it helps to tap new markets, both locally and overseas. So back when I was in Auckland, I met this really inspiring guy called Mitchell Pham. He arrived as a child refugee uh, from uh, Vietnam. And now he is uh, an extremely successful uh, tech entrepreneur. And someone who was forced out of his country by the government who didn't want him is now in high demand back in Vietnam because he's successful. And he's helping to foster trade and investment links between Vietnam and New Zealand. Now, in the small Australian town of Nil, which is about 350 kilometers from Melbourne, probably not dissimilar to many small towns uh, in uh, uh, New Zealand, the biggest employer is a poultry producer called uh, Loverduck. And Loverduck wanted to expand, but they couldn't find the workers that they needed locally. So they got in touch with the National Settlement Agency, who provide a free recruitment service and suitable workers. And then they sent over a group of Karen refugees from Myanmar. And when the first group came, they hired four of them. Now there are more than 50 of them working uh, in Nil uh, at both Loverduck and local poultry farms. And what they, what the added bonus of all this, they haven't just enabled Loverduck to expand, they've revitalized a small town that was dying and all the local businesses in it um, through uh, this influx uh, of refugees. The, the benefits then are not just to the business, they're to the broader community. And then you have the benefits of diversity, of course, which can be huge. In Canada, a bit like in New Zealand, uh, refugees often struggle to find work um, because employers insist uh, on local work experience. But the Business Development Bank of Canada takes a different approach. They think that internationally trained talent uh, is a huge bonus. And one of their recent hires is Mustafa Fadel. He's an IT engineer from Syria. And their belief in hiring them was not just that he had excellent IT skills, but also that he had different experience and different perspectives, and that would help make their team stronger. And again, there is strong research to show that diversity is good for economic performance. For example, McKinsey, the consultancy, found that businesses that are in the top 25% for racial and ethnic diversity tend to have 35% above average financial returns. And that is a real sizable economic benefit. So I've talked then about the benefits uh, that refugees can provide as hardworking, highly motivated employees, whether it's with skills, whether it's doing difficult jobs, or whether it's bringing their diversity. At the same time, they're very loyal employees. So once you hire one, they tend to stay. 
And that makes a real difference for businesses because one of the biggest costs that businesses face is that you've got a valued employee, they leave, you have to find a new one, uh, and then you have to train them up. And that costs a lot of money. And research by the Tent Foundation uh, demonstrates um, that there's a much higher retention rate uh, for refugees. To give you just one example, an American company that makes uh, wooden pallets called LNR Pallet. And previously, they had a real problem with retention. The average worker used to stay in the job only four months. Now, most of their, most of their employees are refugees, and the average worker has been there seven years. And profits have soared. And then, it's not just that you keep the refugees that you hire. Once you hire one, it becomes much easier to hire others because they tell uh, their friends in the community, I found a really good employer here, you should come join me. And that's the example that I gave you of Love a Duck uh, in uh, Australia. And employers also develop a relationship uh, with refugee communities. They develop uh, experience of integrating them into the workforce. And that in turn makes it easier to find uh, new hires. All in all then, there is a compelling business case for hiring refugees. As you can see, I went for H's. They're hardworking, they're highly motivated, they're heterogeneous or diverse, they're high and low skilled, and you can hang on to them. Okay, I've given you the positive case, which is, in my view, strong and based on evidence, my research uh, and others. At the same time, of course, there can be hurdles uh, that organizations face uh, in hiring refugees here in New Zealand. I think the first is a lack of awareness. You know, businesses might not even be aware uh, that there are refugees around with the skills that they need um, or that they would make um, good employees. And part of the, the aim of, of this week where I've met with all sorts of different people uh, to present my research and to present uh, this case is to help raise awareness uh, so that employers who might think, well, you know, we can't find anyone or we need to look overseas, actually on your doorstep you might have someone who might be able to fill your job. The second is, well, you might be aware, but you don't know where to find suitable uh, local candidates. Now, uh, there is an existing program provided by the Red Cross called Pathways to Employment for Refugees. Uh, at the same time, uh, an NGO called Host International is partnering with a online platform from Australia called Refugee Talent that helps match employers uh, to uh, refugees. Uh, and they are um, launching in uh, New Zealand now. And if you think about it, if you or I were going to look uh, for a job, we'd probably do it nowadays online. We might have a LinkedIn profile, we might you know, look for uh, online job ads. And it makes perfect sense that we should be applying the same online technologies to help match refugees um, to employers. A third hurdle may be that you know, employers are wary of hiring refugees who don't have local experience or qualifications. And experience in Canada and elsewhere shows that internships and work experience programs are absolutely crucial uh, in getting over uh, that hurdle. And also mentoring can make a really big difference in creating those contacts and you, know, you can vouch that this is someone to, to, your, to people that you know, this, this, is, this is someone that you ought to hire. There's also a lot of work that universities can do, that professional bodies can do, uh, in terms of uh, recognising or helping to recognise or helping to foreign qualifications or indeed uh, equivalent ones. So for example in Sweden they had a large influx of pharmacists uh, from uh, Syria. And the professional body for pharmacists got together to uh, assess you know, how competent the Syrians were and to provide them with a Swedish qualification as quickly as possible. That's a really practical way uh, in which professional communities and indeed universities can get involved uh, in helping to facilitate those people who do have qualifications to work here. And then last but not least, employers might be wary about language and cultural barriers. Now there's a thing called, um, there's an, uh, an organization called English Language Partners. They provide a program uh, of uh, English language training uh, for employers and employees. It's a program that you can make use of. At the same time, there are also many courses that provide 
um, cultural awareness uh, and understanding uh, training. And what most, what most employers find who do take that big leap and say, actually, yes, we want to go out and hire a refugee, is that they don't only become good employees uh, for, for employers for refugees, they become better employers uh, in general. Because suddenly, you know, if they've opened their eyes to um, the, the potential of refugee talent, they open their eyes more broadly to a wider talent pool that might be around. Or if they learn to communicate more clearly uh, with uh, people who don't speak English as a first language, they also tend to learn to communicate more clearly uh, with their native English speaking um, staff, or if they've learnt to integrate refugees into their workforce, they also tend to be better at melding together uh, a team made up of people from uh, different backgrounds, you know, uh, men and women, people from North Ireland and South Ireland, people who've been to university and who haven't, uh, people who um, are extrovert and introvert, all the ways in which you make the most of a diverse team. So while there may be additional costs uh, in recruiting refugees. They tend to be rapidly repaid in terms of higher productivity and lower staff turnover. Again, you could put numbers on it. There's a study from the Boston Consulting Group uh, in Germany, uh, and they find there that the payback period uh, for um, investing in recruiting a refugee uh, is typically only uh, a year. So for me, it's a compelling argument I hope uh, that um, I've started uh, to make the case for you today. Um, you can encapsulate it in a nutshell, which is that doing good can be good business and that refugees work. And I hope that you will go out and spread the word. And I hope that some of you, if you do run a business or an organization or you have a say in it, uh, will consider going out uh, and trying to recruit a refugee. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe, for that. Um, so we've got some time left here for um, general questions and comments on the floor. Um, so I'll moderate that, that little piece of the session. So go ahead. Um, thank you for your talk. A lot of these people have come from really traumatic Experiences. So overseas, we've got people around helping with post traumatic stress, and particularly in the New Zealand context where our mental health services are quite depleted, in fact, if they're in Canterbury, I'm just interested in what's the most successful helping that transition. Well, it's true that some people, uh, some refugees uh, are suffering from PTSD and that um, they need help with that. I was just speaking to um, a psychologist in um, Wellington who is doing um, research and her findings is actually though many um, refugees have suffered a lot um, that many of them are not suffering from PTSD and are you know not just uh, willing but very keen to get into um, uh, the workforce um, and so uh, I think that while it's right uh, for us to show compassion to people who have suffered a lot I think it is um, a mistake um, to think of them as uh, victims uh, who you know, aren't capable of contributing to uh, New Zealand because uh, they want to and they can. So I, I'm sort of interested in whether, um, in, in the research, um, whether the vetting process has affected the the um, results in the sense that because countries vet refugees before they come in, what they've done is ended up taking all of the ones, or the ones they take are ones that are going to um, integrate well, have skills that match, have, I don't know, things that mean that it'll be a success story. Um, you know, what would the world look like in your view if um, you know, because it's quite tightly controlled, isn't it, at the moment? And so this number is very small. So it could be a self-selection issue, do well, you think, or not? The, the existing refugee resettlement programs don't involve selection on the basis right. of skill. And very often, actually, um, countries 
do what you would think would be um, the opposite, i.e. they choose the most vulnerable, they choose right. single women, they choose children. Um, so uh, it, while in, in theory you could be right, uh, in practice I, I don't think there's any evidence uh, that that's the case. If anything, you'd expect it to go in the other direction. I was just picking up on your comment where you said that countries be so the ones that actually make well, I mean, the process... Well, I mean, I meant by carefully vetted in terms that they vetted whether they're a security risk uh, and stuff like that. Oh, that's okay, what I meant. Right, right. And there is, I mean, so just to add to that, there is a program called Talent Beyond Boundaries, um, which is for people who are um, refugees um, who are highly skilled. And what they're trying to do is to say, well, rather than trying to get into the refugee queue, if we can find an employer uh, in an advanced economy who can offer you a job, you could come in as a highly skilled migrant instead and just you know, skip that whole um, uh, process. Um, and. Um, they're having you know, promising results uh, in, in some countries, and that's certainly uh, you know, something which, which, which can complement the existing schemes. Sorry. Yeah, so New Zealand's a nation of small businesses, and um, I guess I'd just like to hear your thoughts about um, how do we help refugees into, uh, into, into businesses where there's typically you know, maybe five employees and the boss is under a lot of pressure, you know, and it's quite a risk to take out an unknown. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how to uh, how to help employers in that situation. Sure. I mean, many people have said that that you know it's, it is a country of small businesses, and that as a result, small businesses owners are, are risk averse, uh, and and uh, so on. I think I would turn the argument around and say, um, uh, obviously, you need to be interview someone properly and be sure uh, or make a good effort to find they're a good fit. Um, uh, but if you make the leap of hiring a refugee, uh, you will be surprised by how hard they work, how motivated they are, how much they contribute, and actually they can transform a small business. Uh, and there's many examples, I quoted only a few in this, but there are many examples of, of that where it starts off with, with hiring one, um, either by chance or um, uh, by design, and that it, that it works so well that you end up uh, hiring uh, many more. And so the potential for uh, a refugee to transform a small Kiwi business uh, is large. Um, coming from a refugee background, I'm just working in the refugee centre. There are a lot of refugees who do work, and they do give back to businesses, they have businesses themselves, it's very successful. But I think what's lacking in New Zealand is that the positive stories, and especially in media, it's not shared. So people just see refugees as a burden, not as people who can benefit the economy. So what, what, are, what are your comments based on like marketing in terms of showing a positive image for refugees who've recently settled in New Zealand? Because there's something that's always promoted in Australia and overseas, but not in New Zealand. We haven't got there yet. Well, I mean, I've only I've, I've only spoken to um, well, I've spoken to quite a few people this week, but obviously only a small size. <coughs> and for the most part, the refugees I've spoken to have said that New Zealand's a very welcoming place. Um, you know, so you already it, it's already a positive step. At the same time, that there can be hurdles to to finding work. Um, and hopefully, through the conversations that I've had, I mean, over this week I've had a breakfast with the Minister of Finance, I've met the Immigration Minister and the Opposition Immigration Minister, I've met the Mayor of Wellington, I've been on TV twice, I've written an article for the National Business Review, I've got, done interviews for other news publications. Hopefully, this starts a national conversation about to try and you know, change those perceptions, those misperceptions of refugees as a burden, and to build on you know, the positive feelings that is felt and the welcoming uh, that is, that, that is um, delivered um, to actually say, well, you know, let's give refugees a chance and let's overcome the hurdles that business might have uh, that would prevent them uh, from uh, hiring refugees. And hopefully, you know, this is the, the start. You know, as I said, it's not for me as a foreigner to say how New Zealand should run its affairs. I'm trying to raise awareness and hopefully then uh, here in New Zealand, people can take that forward. Oh, 
All right, so uh, first of all, it's where I really appreciate you talk a lot. I think um, there are so many uh, difficult issues in the world that when somebody can come along and say they have a win-win, uh, that's a very encouraging message and one that um, I both want to believe and I think I do believe. A um, couple things. The first point is going to be sound really weird, um, but I know this whole issue of immigration is hotly contested from lots of different sources. Um, you've got the word open uh, several times on that slide. There's a whole open science movement uh, to try and make uh, data uh, available to everybody. And maybe you already do this, but I know that it would be, I think, very encouraging if you could make all the data behind your books uh, publicly accessible. So if somebody wanted to actually get in there and play around with the data themselves, that would be um, uh, help add credibility to your arguments. So that's the first point. The second point is, a couple of years ago, we had David Carr here, um, a well-known economist who has done, among other areas, research and immigration. And his message was very much that immigration is a win-win uh, for economies that uh, take in immigrants. And, um, but it was pretty clear to me after the end of this talk that really uh, a lot of the public resistance to immigration has got actually not so much to do with economics. It's a lot more to do with culture. And a lot more people being concerned that bringing in people with different values uh, affects the communities they live in and affects the kind of uh, uh, environment that they've created. And I just, you know, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that um, or if that's part of your presentation too, or if you just focus on the business side of things. I think to connect with people, uh, those cultural issues actually end up being pretty important. Well, I mean, one I've written a whole book called Immigrants in a Country in Eastern. And many other articles since then. So it's not an issue at all. As it, of course, it's an issue that I address. It's just not the topic um, that I've come to New Zealand to talk about mm -hmm. or indeed to present about here. If I can just say, you know, briefly, I don't think economics and culture are separate. I think that, um, you know, economists tend to focus on economic, the economics and the political science jump in and say it's all culture. And I think, I think it's a mistake to, to look at them as separate. You know, it's why is there a growing backlash against immigration in the United States? Uh, have all of a sudden uh, people become much more racist than they were 10 years ago? Perhaps, or perhaps actually um, people are more, part of the reason why they're expressing opposition to immigration is because they're more unhappy with their lives than they were before, um, because they've lost jobs, because their wages are stagnating. Uh, and. Uh, that at times like that distributional issues come to the fore and when they get overlaid with identity issues um, it is expressed in a, in, in a vehement cultural way it doesn't mean that it's unlinked or separate from economics but that's really not the topic of, that we're discussing today Does the research have anything to say about the experience and success of refugees according to whether or not they speak the language of the country they land in. In other words, if you have, if you know the language of the country you land in, is that an advantage, or is it something that gets weeded out in the long run? Oh, it's only a short la time language, time. language is absolutely crucial. That I, all the, the research, I mean, I, I did a report called Step Up, um, uh, which is a how to uh, speed up uh, refugees entry into work, looking at evidence from 22 advanced economies, and uh, yes, it's. The very, 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 very language is very, very important, um, but uh, you don't need to speak fluent English in order to get a job. And in fact, you know, programs which you know, which say first you need to master the local language before trying to find work is actually the wrong way of going to get about it. Actually, one, there are jobs that you can do speaking you know, little or no English. You can be a computer programmer or indeed you can wash dishes without speaking English. Second of all, once you know that, for many jobs, once you know the basics that are required for work, you can start working. And then when you do that, uh, you learn English on the job, even better uh, if there are language classes provided in, 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 um, uh, as well as um, a part-time uh, work. Uh, and that the, the, the process of integrating uh, into uh, the workforce uh, by starting to work uh, boost your skills, boost your connections with uh, the local society, and boost your um, uh, long-term uh, performance. So you're absolutely right, language is crucial, but it, as, as, as soon as you have even a little of it, you can start working.
You mentioned earlier the 70 percent of refugees that may arrive in the Canada, in the USA during the year to get a job. Yeah. So what's the question there is whether there's a more kind of job of opportunity in USA and Canada. How about Europe or some other country? Well, the, the record in some Europe, well, the, the best European country in terms of, in terms of employing refugees is, is Switzerland. And surprisingly, the second is Italy. In many European countries, um, uh, they do less well. And yes, that is blamed on refugees as somehow that they don't have uh, the requisite qualifications or attitudes or work ethic. And yet, I compared how Somali immigrants fare in the United States against how they fare in Europe. And you find that similar Somali immigrants have much higher employment rates in the US than they do in, the, in, in Europe. And what that tells you is it's not due to the characteristics of the, the Somali immigrants. A large amount is to do with the labor market institutions that exist. So in Europe, uh, very often there are very rigid labor markets, which means that it's very hard for people who um, uh, don't have uh, high skills uh, to find jobs. And that's something which also affects um, you know, young Europeans, not just um, newly arrived um, refugees. Or there are highly regulated labor markets in terms of the rep what is needed to do a job. So for example, in my own country, Britain, you can start working as a bricklayer without any qualification whatsoever and you can learn on the job. In Germany, you need a three-year qualification and it's a three-year qualification which also includes written and uh, oral German. So you could be you could be someone who is a brilliant builder from Syria. You won't be able to find a job in Germany um, immediately. Um, uh, it will take it will take time. Um, so there are there are significant differences now. As a result of the large influx that there's been of refugees um, to Germany and to Sweden uh, in recent years, policy is changing because you know, policymakers are realizing that many of these hurdles that have been imposed are actually counterproductive. But um, the important message from it is that you know, you, you know, one shouldn't leap to the conclusion just because there is low <coughs> refugee employment rates uh, in, in Europe, that somehow this is due to the individual characteristics rather than the characteristic of the system as a whole. The good thing about New Zealand is New Zealand generally has a, a pretty flexible labour market and you have um, low unemployment uh, and therefore the hurdles that exist for the most part aren't formal hurdles due to policy, they're more due to uh, risk aversion from businesses and those kinds of things and that's why um, hopefully um, the message that we're putting across can, together with the help that's provided can help overcome them. So I find it interesting that you mentioned Switzerland as being highly rated for employment of refugees. Uh, I'm not an expert in this field, but what I've heard is that they hire refugees on, on shorter term contracts with, um, with conditions that are not as favorable as a full time contract. And so I'm just wondering in your research and analyzing um, the quality of the employment of the refugees, are you looking at that? Like, are they are they underemployed, not being paid well enough? The local market conditions, can they actually afford to pay for housing and basic needs and that sort of thing? Well, I mean, certainly, um, whether you're a refugee or indeed whether you're a, a migrant, you initially tend to um, suffer um, a downgrading of skills. Are you're not going to go straight into the job that you did before? Um, both for the formal reasons that I mentioned about qualifications, but also simply because you're entering into a labor market and where you're um, uh, low status um, rather than having the status you had before. Um, at the same time, all the research shows, and my grandfather's personal experience also as an anecdotal uh, confirms, um, that uh, it makes sense for people who are highly qualified to start working quickly. Um, because being out of work for a sustained period of time rusts their skills, demotivates them, and makes them ever less employable. It's, a, it's similar to the impact of long-term unemployment on a, on a native uh, Kiwi worker. Uh, and while it's important that there be a pathway from um, uh, low-skilled work to try to reach a high-skilled work that you were in before, um, that waiting and for the perfect job to arrive is the wrong strategy. 
both for the refugee uh, and uh, for society uh, as a whole. Now, clearly, you know, um, there are people who get stuck, and to a certain extent, um, you know, you hear you know, many stories of uh, people with PhDs driving, driving cabs for that kind of thing. Um, I'd say, one, A, that's better than nothing, you're safe and you're earning a living, and two, um, you're investing in the future generation. Is it ideal? Can we do better? Of course we can do better, but it's still, you know, it's, it's still um, a step forward. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. I wonder whether you could talk a little bit about the potential role that refugees that are already residing in a certain country have in regard to integrating newly arrived refugees um, into uh, workforce in all other areas. Uh, whether that has any significance or importance. Also, maybe in comparison to, say, existing government agencies that are obviously doing their, their, their jobs. Well, I mean, uh, I think. Yes, I mean, they tend to be very, well, most, most governments tend to settle refugee communities together to a certain extent, um, and therefore, and even when they don't, refugees initially tend to congregate together in communities, um, which means that those who have arrived previously or those who are already in work can help provide um, a, a network of contacts, of mentoring, of information, uh, that can help uh, new arrivals, um, and um, that you know, new businesses arise to serve local communities, uh, and so on. Uh, at the same time, all the research shows that it's very important to have contacts outside the refugee community, and that's the importance, therefore, of, in particular, of, of mentoring programs, uh, so that you broaden your contacts and you're not just uh, in, a, in a very small local um, uh, labour market. Um, I noticed that a lot of the examples, possibly all of them, um, of the successful refugees were men. And in Europe, at least, a majority of the refugees that have come in in the last three years have been men. And I wonder if, um, if your work shows that either there are differences in the success of people, of, you know, of men and women, or, I don't know, or do women succeed as much as men, even though men make up the bulk of refugees, or...? Well, overall, overall, male refugees in most countries have a higher um, uh, employment rate uh, than female refugees do, um, for a variety of reasons. The only exception to that, I think, is, if I remember correctly, is Norway. Um, uh, but, and depending by, yeah, there are, there are a few places where refugee women do better than local women. And I think it might be Italy. I, might, I can't remember off the top of my head. But yes, you're right overall, uh, male refugees do better than, than female refugees. And that's clearly something um, that needs to be addressed. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, for saying to work with the research and opportunity and the opportunity for all services and organizations with contributions for varieties and economics. I am also a refugee. I came to New Zealand just seven months because I have problems in Cambodia because my opposition party was too so. And uh, as a member of the National Assembly, I have escaped from the country and I got the refugees from the New Zealand government right now. And I got the work visa. And so my challenge is from now is concerned to uh, job hunting. That is uh, the point that I need to start to repair my future here. And my question is, uh, you do do the research concerning to the challenge for the refugee in terms of their yeah, uh, living in each country that where they going to get the refugees. So I didn't actually hear the last you bit. Do you do, do the research on the challenge of the refugees being faced for their uh, future uh, repair in, in the country where they? Sure. I mean, uh, the, the challenge is that, that um, 
the, my, my, my research which looks at uh, how to get refugees into work quickly, I mean, is framed in terms of how to get refugees into work and the way that you look at it, if you just turn the frame around, obviously it's the challenges that the refugees face. Now, um, one, one which is faced not by resettled refugees, but by asylum seekers is obtaining the right to work. And that's a big challenge, which exists um, notably um, in Europe, but also in other places that receive large numbers of asylum seekers. Um, uh, the second is in terms of appropriate skills, and that's whether it's um, uh, language training, um, uh, whether it is um, uh, uh, the recogn recognition of qualifications, um, uh, whether it is um, uh, uh, appropriate um, knowledge about local norms and, and working practices. Um, and, and last, there have to be employment opportunities. Uh, and so there are issues like where refugees are resettled. Like for example, in Sweden, Sweden used to relocate um, refugees across the whole country without taking into account employment opportunities. And now they've changed their policy to relocate refugees on the basis of where there actually are jobs. Um, or uh, a second factor in terms of employment opportunities, I've already talked about you know, labor markets which are more or less uh, open insider, outsider, uh, and, and so on. And I think a crucial component here, as I said, in New Zealand is you know, the, the attitudes of businesses, the lack of awareness, uh, and um, you know, the, um, the need to take uh, that leap of faith uh, to hire someone like you, because I'm sure you'd be uh, you know, a great employee. Okay, well, with that very uh, lovely message, let's uh, thank uh, Philippe for his talk tonight, and then we can go outside and have a nice little reception. <laughs>